So, NFTs. Bought one of those recently? Maybe. Did you pay too much for it? We reckon you may well have done. Why? Well, two words. Wash trading. If you haven't heard those words, we're about to tell you what they are. And if you're at all interested in NFTs or indeed any sort of financial skullduggery, you're going to want to hear this. So let's tell you what it is. Wash trading is a form of market manipulation. Essentially, an investor or investors repeatedly buy and sell the same financial instrument. What this does is artificially inflate the market for that instrument. In turn, it potentially allows commissions to be made liquidity on instruments to appear bigger than they actually are, and innocent parties to potentially pay more than they should do for that instrument. Now, wash trading gives the mistaken impression that something is more in demand than it actually is, but it's not new. In fact, it's been around for quite a long time. The US actually made it illegal all the way back in 1936. Since then, rules have been imposed on wash trading of various varieties all over the world that only really cover traditional instruments like securities. They haven't yet caught up with crypto and markets like those for NFTs aren't yet covered. But they are starting to be talked about and they're also the subject of books like NFT from Zero to Hero by Andy Lian. We're actually going to hear from Andy in just a second about all of this, but first... Let's just run through a quick example that Andy showed us to explain how this might happen with an NFT. So take a look at this data from Footprint Analytics. It covers activity on the X2Y2 marketplace for a single NFT from the Dreadfuls collection. It shows that one NFT, ID number 164, goes back and forth multiple times between the same two wallets. A total of 19 trades took place between those two on one single day, September the 1st this year. You can see address one here is in blue, while address two is in red. Now these trades generated over 7,000 ETH in volume and 36 ETH in platform fees. Ethereum at the time was worth about 1,500 US dollars. Now as Andy explains, there are a couple of different motives for doing these sorts of wash trades. Some of these marketplaces, they reward active users by giving them a return uh, based on the whole trading volume. So watch traders will take advantage of this and then maximize their rewards by you know generating a, a huge trading volume. You know it's, it's a form or, or, or a way to deceive users you know who who think that oh this uh, collection is is cool it has good liquidity and, and is, is, a, is a good NFT to have. Then the type 2 that I look at there's a false uh, pumped value of uh, uh, NFT that's been transacted. People will think that this project itself is something that is very, very lucrative. Then the genuine buyers are then tricked into buying the NFT. So how common is this and are any of the big name collections likely to have been affected? If you if you look at the market in general, you know, almost all projects would have a little bit of wash trade. You know, a little bit of wash trading is not something that is uh, to be very alarmed or, or to be, well, taken aback and, and so forth. Projects with good amount of liquidity, good a good number of uh, community, with some wash trading, I think it's a very normal sign. You know, it could be even a peer-to-peer between a friend. You just, you, you just want to check up the price. I think that is fair. But there are other groups of uh, projects with no community, purely working on Wall Street to get their price up. I think those are the ones that are really bad actors, you know, in in this space. And these are the projects that you really want to avoid totally because there is nothing backing up the project. If you manage to spot one of these trades at work though, there is something you can do about it. First of all, you can, of course, not buy the NFT, Uh, but it's worth considering, as Andy says, the bigger picture here. So, so given that you like the design, the price point is good, you know, the next thing for any normal retail buyer, you know, would be looking at the community, you know, it's more straightforward because a retail buyer may not have the time to access to all the different tools that I've mentioned in my book, for example, but they can check on two things. One is the community, you know, and then two is on the uh, uh, reality chart. Right, so you 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 know, 
uh, who are the people backing it? You know, are there re- are there real people? That's 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 number one, and then and then number two is you know what exactly you are aiming for. Mm, I do not suggest normal buyers to really go through the details of uh, uh, on chain analysis. So, is this something that regulators should actively be looking at, and what can the industry do to help? Regulators are always playing a catching up game. Uh, most of the time, and and again, most of the time, they do not really get the right kind of information from the industry. You know, by the time they get the in, the information, and again, usually it's too late. So I don't think the regulators are in that position to do an active role to police all these NFTs uh, activities. I think education and information is something that is really lacking. Uh, regulations will definitely kick in at a at a later stage. Um, but not now, you know, because right now it's still in a growing phase, and um, I hope to see it grow a lot f- faster and further. Andy's advice is to always look for the support of a community, especially if you aren't sure on the purchase of an NFT or indeed anything else. So now you know. Watch trading. There you go. What is information worth in modern society? Quite possibly, it's worth more than anything else. But when it comes to things that are supposed to be public, not everyone is actually able to access the data that they are entitled to. Now, blockchain technology has the potential to transform this as we know, and that's what we're talking about in this episode of Future Rules with Michael Morrissey. He's the founder of Muckrock, which is a non-profit organization that helps people get information from the US government. It's great to have you with us, Michael. Can you talk to us about what the gaps are in the current system in terms of accessing data for users and how Mark Rock is set to bridge these? We primarily work with journalists, activists, uh, other people who are trying to open up government or help the public understand, better understand their world. And a lot of times that means kind of going after and, and analyzing and then sharing really sensitive materials. What we've seen is that companies and oligarchs and uh, governments are increasingly sophisticated in sort of how they pressure hosting providers, uh, how they pressure ISPs to kind of remove that information. So what you see is sort of the the people who really need to be exposed are instead the ones protected um, through a lot of these maneuvers. And what blockchain does and what Filecoin in particular does is kind of help flip that so that you don't have to rely on sort of one sort of legal regime or one sort of hosting provider kind of make sure that those documents are accessible. And we've seen time and time again, access to these primary source materials is really what helps convince the public that this is a legitimate issue, right? So that's the theoretical attraction and practice of how this works. How is Filecoin and IPFS protocol helping overcome these roadblocks? Yeah, I mean, I think increasingly you're seeing those theoretical um, uh, challenges become real world challenges, right? I think one of the things we're, we see is um, we had a, a countrywide block against um, one of our services uh, because somebody filed a complaint about one document that, that we hosted. And that was, you know, across an entire nation, we were unavailable for a week until we sorted out bureaucratically. And so what we're looking at is sort of the ability for um, Filecoin, do- Filecoin documents to be accessible uh, via a range of ways to kind of route to that information. Um, but also we've seen increasing pressure from from hosting providers in terms of making this information available. So I think these things sort of seem theoretical. The, the splinter net seems sort of theoretical, um, but we're seeing sort of the edges of it, uh, you know, happening day to day for a lot of our users and, and across some of our services. Regulation and lawmakers seem now to be catching up with a lot of this technology and bringing that into uh, the regulatory sphere. How much concern do you think that that's going to have for those working in this sphere with data rather than with transactions. Yeah, I, I absolutely think it's it's a really um, interesting time to be kind of like pushing the boundaries on some of these issues, right? And we've been talking with a lot of our users about GDPR, right? Okay, if they can push something to GDPR, but they, if they can push something to Filecoin, but they don't necessarily have the mechanisms to remove something from the network, um, what kind of liability does that can uh, you know, kind of incur for them. Uh, what are some of the challenges, but also those opportunities? I think one thing we have consistently seen out of the European Union, uh, GDPR regulations, right to be forgotten, uh, is a lot of times that these come out as very well-meaning and in a lot of cases, a very important legislation in terms of sort of protecting privacy or 
um, making sure that there's ample competition, but instead they kind of often have the, the opposite intent, right? We talked about the oligarchs who are using right to be forgotten and GDPR to kind of protect their misdeeds. Um, and so I think this is a really important time where if we can get a strong civil society component in these discussions and we can kind of highlight these use cases and also these abuses, hopefully we can craft better, better regulation. All right, that was Michael Morrissey from MuckRock talking to us there. You'll be able to hear more about this and plenty else at the Phil Lisbon Summit. That is coming up on October 30th and running until November the 4th. And finally, just a quick reminder that Forecast's latest Crypto Rising livestream event is coming next month. It's taking place 9 p.m. Eastern, November 14th, 9 a.m. Hong Kong time, November 15th. Forecast's editor-in-chief, Angie Lau, will be leading the conversation into why some investors and VCs are betting big on digital asset startups despite the crypto winter. Be sure to sign up at forecast.news or by clicking the link in the description below. Otherwise, that's it from us. Like and subscribe to this video for more content like it.